Thanks for tuning in to this message. My name is Jared Piney. I'm the online pastor here at Pathway, and I'm here with one of our worship directors and online hosts, Maddie Seitz. We hope this message is a valuable resource to you and helps you grow deeper in your faith. If you consider yourself a Christian and this message blesses you, I hope you'd consider giving back to us at Pathway so we can continue connecting all people to Jesus and helping them become his fully devoted followers. Learn more at pathwaychurch.com forward slash giving. And if you decide to take a step in your faith after the message today, simply visit pathwaychurch.com forward slash next so we can help provide you with resources and partner with you in this journey. I want to welcome Goddard Valley Center, Westlink, those of you who are watching online. We have a great weekend planned for you, man. We are celebrating. It's been so awesome to go through this last series. We've been talking about one at a time, but we're making a transition today, and I want to talk about how we can shine, how we can shine in our city, how we can make a difference, impact the community in which God has called us to just be a part of. Man, I'll tell you, recently I was on my phone and I was checking out the Chiefs kind of stats of the game. I was going back through this, one of my favorite things to do, and just look and see how all the different players played. You know, how many touchdowns did Mahomes throw? How many touchdowns did Kelsey score? How many? Four. Wow, man, he was on fire. It was awesome to watch. And then I begin to see something that kind of interests me. It wasn't article and from that article I found another article and pretty soon I found myself on a news site. I went from my sports app to a news site and as I was digging in and reading article after article, it was really discouraging. I mean, have you ever been there where you're kind of get intrigued by something that's going on in our country or even in our city and pretty soon you feel like you're kind of spiraling the drain? You know, there's so much discouragement in in the way that people are treated, in in the suffering and pain that people experience. I mean, honestly, it can get kind of overwhelming. And I can find myself get intrigued, get pulled in. You know, there's this article that I kind of get started with. And then after a while, man, it's been 15 minutes, it's been 30 minutes, and I just feel a little deflated. It's not just our country that's struggling, it's also our city. I want to give you just a brief snapshot of some things that are going on here in Wichita, the city that we love, the city that we live in. This is what they tell us about our city. Child Protective Service reports that Wichita, listen, leads our statewide average in educational neglect, medical neglect, and the physical abuse of children. Not a stat you want. In the past four years, the number of people who died from drug overdoses annually in Sedgwick County more than doubled, a dramatic increase attributed almost entirely to fentanyl. They say this too, that in Kansas, not just in Wichita, but in Kansas in 2020, there were 7,000 children in foster care. When you read just this little snapshot of our city You start seeing some of the comparisons even to our state. It can get a little overwhelming. I mean, and that's just brief. I mean, I spent time studying and researching this week, and, you know, the news isn't awesome. And and it honestly can leave you in this state where you're kind of like, man, what's going on? 
I, I don't know if it's that I'm getting older and all of a sudden I'm more interested or, or these incidents are just reported more. But either way, you start to be concerned. You know, why are there so many kids today, innocent kids that are being left behind? Or why do we have so many kids waiting to be in homes where people will care for them and love them? Why aren't we more focused on helping people with these addictions that are actually ripping families apart? Why is violent crime on the increase in our country and even in our city? I mean, some people are even scared to walk out of their shift at night into a dark parking lot. I mean, it's, it's getting kind of wild. You know, you see these things in our community, and you do worry, you do get concerned, and you start asking questions. Now, I think that questions are something that God built in us. It's a response to the things that we see. And one of the things that I remembered as I was studying this week was the questions that my children would ask. You know, the questions that children ask, they're super entertaining, aren't they? I mean, they're fun, they're innocent. And one of my favorite places to watch them ask these heartfelt questions, the problems that weren't going on in the world, but the problems that were going on in their world was during prayer time. And so I went out and I looked at some prayers that kids ask and these questions that they want to know of God or these statements they want to make to God to understand better. It's like the little girl who prayed. She said, dear God, I guess I should thank you for my little brother, but I really asked for a puppy, you know? I mean, why, God? Why did I pray for a puppy and all of a sudden this little boy lands in my home? You know, there was the prayer of this other child. He said, you know, God, I just want to let you know there's nothing really good between Christmas and Easter. So if you could put something good there, that would be awesome, you know? So just trying to help God get on the calendar, help this little guy out a little bit. There was another little boy that uh, was praying, and he said, Dear God, I was talking to my grandpa, and he said you were around when he was a little boy. How far do you go back, God? I want to know, you know? You go back a long ways. I I love this one. There was a little girl who prayed this. God, I'm sure it's difficult to love everybody in the world. I have four people in my family, and it's hard for me, you know? Anybody uh, resonate, you know? Yeah, sometimes it's kind of hard. I hate to admit it. And we do have these questions, and it's fun to look at it through a child's eye or their mind because a lot of times they're very innocent. They're just scratching the surface, but everyone has questions. You know, and the Christian pollster guru, Barna, would say this is a question that is at the top of everyone's list that they would like to ask God. And here it is. Why does God allow bad things to happen? How many of you have wondered that before? I mean, you've been in a setting and you've seen something horrific, something awful happen in life, And you can be a seasoned veteran in your relationship with Jesus and go, why? Why did God allow that to happen? I mean, does God really care about that? I mean, is it something that is important to him? You know, there's this angst that we feel when we see these bad things happen. Jesus made an observation. It was in the Sermon on the Mount. Here's simply what he said. He said, God sends rain on the just and the unjust. So it goes both ways. You know, it's difficult to understand, but we see that you can't always predict why bad things happen. Now, this is something that we deal with in life, these bad things, and we're always trying to understand why. I think the question is good because it reveals something about you and I. See, we are hardwired when we see suffering, when we experience suffering, to really come to the point where we want something done about it. I mean, it's not like information we just take in and we go, oh, okay, I'm just going to keep moving on with my day, moving on with my life. 
We go, no, this is unjust. Something needs to be done about this. I want to ask you, I want this to get down into your heart and your mind right now. I want to ask you, what is that thing for you? What, what is that thing that you see that happens in life that really you think is unjust, it's unfair, you hate to see people suffer in this way? I want you to dial in right now and think about that one thing that irritates you. I mean, it creates angst in you. You have it? Okay, here's what I want us to do. I want us now to open up our Pathway app if you don't have it open. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to John 9. And I want us to look at a man that Jesus used to talk about this issue. A man that's been dealt a difficult hand. Here's what it says, starting in John 9. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. From birth, a Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? Here's what I want you to see. The disciples are using this man to ask a question that bugs them, a question that bugs many of us today. Here's the question. Why did this happen? Did he do something wrong or did someone else do something wrong? You know what they're really getting at here? They want to know whose fault is this? Isn't that where we struggle sometimes? We want to know, like, whose fault is this and how can we get this fixed? You know, blind people were very common in the disciples' day. I don't know if you stopped and thought about it before, but the truth is if you had a vision difficulty in any way, it could cause your life to look very different. You know, when I read about the blind man in the Bible, I think of myself. The truth is, uh, I suffer from myopia. I am nearsighted. And I'm not nearsighted a little bit. I'm nearsighted a lot. Years ago, I went to an optometrist. He was a, a guy who had a kind of a, a little shop, but he was uh, really good at what he did, and so I wanted to go visit him. And I remember being there in the chair and then bringing the machine and putting it in front of me. Many of you have experienced this. And they have these lenses that they click or that they flip. And they're asking you to tell them, is that eye chart on the wall getting clearer? I mean, does this help or does that help? Do you like this, this one? And as he was clicking through the lenses, flipping the lenses, he finally got to a point where he goes, that's it. And I said, what do you mean that's it? He said, that's all I got. I was like, what do you mean that's all? You don't have any other lenses? You can, you've got to flip or a turn? I mean, come on. He goes, no, you beat the machine. And I tell you, that's not something you want on your record. You know, you don't want to beat that machine. I was like, you, you've got to be kidding me. What do you mean I beat the machine? That's all I have. You know, when we read about this man who is blind um, and we see this, the disciples, once again, would have been very um, normalized to this. This was just part of their day, seeing people like this. But they use this man because they're trying to figure something out. And I want you to know this, too. I've got to give you a little bit of background. There is a common belief in the disciples' day, and the common belief was this. The rabbis taught it, the spiritual leaders of the day, that when someone sinned, God would punish them for their sin. And so that's why the disciples asked the question, who sinned? Was it this man or was it family? Because if they couldn't track it to the individual, if they couldn't figure it out, they would begin to attribute it to the parents. You know, if someone's wrong here, once again, who's at fault? And so they're trying to understand this, and they're using this man for this point of discussion. And really, once again, as we see this, we kind of can look at it and go, man, that, that's really archaic thinking. I mean, how could the disciples think something like that? But is it? Do you and I hold on to a belief like that sometimes? 
that when someone sins, God is right there ready to punish them? You know what we say? We say things like this. Well, they got what they deserved. That's where we give it away. There is part of this soundtrack, I think, that we tend to believe. I know it played in my life recently. This soundtrack, trying to question why bad things happen. You see, in our home in the past six months, we've had four major water leaks. I mean, it's been chaos. It's honestly made me angry. I've been frustrated. I feel like I'm putting an addition on my plumber's house, you know. I mean, all these things you experience. And just about a month ago, when I got done preaching, I went home, had dinner with the family, and I headed to my favorite activity, sitting in front of the TV watching football. And as I was sitting in front of the TV, I began to kind of sleep a little bit, watch a little bit. You know, I'm getting to be an old man, you know, back and forth. And I see my wife come downstairs, Sarah, and she goes into one of our rooms, and I hear her call me, hey, Todd, come here. And so I get up, and I begin to walk over to the room, and when I come to the room, I see her staring at the ceiling at this. Now, I don't know if you've had one of these in your home before, but you're not supposed to have this in your ceiling. This is a bubble that is full of water, and if you poke it, there is a lot of water that comes out. And I remember that day as we sat there and stared at the ceiling together, now onto our fourth leak, I just leaned into Sarah and I just said, baby, are we doing something wrong? It was that soundtrack, that soundtrack playing. Man, is, is there something that God is punishing us for. I know it's not true, but it's easy to start believing, well, why do these bad things happen? You know, I, I think it's so important for us as we look at this just to understand that this thought is one that we can have, but it's one also we've seen in the Bible before. It doesn't just start here with the blind man, right? Maybe some of you are already ahead of me. Do you remember Job? Do you remember Job was a man in the Old Testament? And you want to talk about tragedy. I mean, four major water leaks, times you, times it, whatever you want. He had so much suffering in his life. And as he had all this suffering, he had a group of friends that came around him, and they were asking why together. Why, Job? Why did this happen? Why did this happen? But you know, they weren't just asking him why. What were they doing? They were accusing him. Job, why did this happen? You need to tell us what you've done. See, Job, we know that you're responsible for this. You know, maybe you have a friend like that, a friend that anytime anything bad happens, they start wondering. You can see their cynicism because they really believe that, like, man, we're in charge of our physical, emotional, mental well-being. Now, we're really the one that plays the cause and effect of life. Now, years ago, when I first started ministry, I had a story of a man who went to visit someone in the hospital that was told to me. And when he went to visit this friend in the hospital, while he was there with his friend, he made this assertion. He said, hey, if you really have the faith that it takes to be healed, you'll pick this Bible I'm going to place on your nightstand up and walk out of this room. I just, you know, sometimes you hear things like that and you're just like dumbfounded. Like, man, why does someone feel that the responsibility is just something that we are sovereign over, that we somehow control? This idea of bad things happening once again. You know, there is a place to ponder these questions. And I think biblical conversation around pain and suffering is great. But I want to point out something that I think we need to consider. The disciples make the blind man an object of discussion rather than an object of compassion. And we do it too. But we're like the disciples. How often do you find yourself seeing some type of tragic event in your neighborhood or in the community, maybe in our country, and all we want to do is talk about it. 
We want to talk about that bad thing that's happening over there. All we want to do is we want to spend time thinking about it. I wonder what could be done. I wonder what solutions need to be really used to solve this problem. But do we act on it? Do we act on those things? Or do we just spend time talking and thinking? Here's the truth of it. It's easier to talk, isn't it? It's easier to talk about the problems of the world than it is actually to dig in and to work at them, to, to really make sure that we're being used as part of the solution. You know, Jesus answers his disciples and the, these teachers who had this belief with something they hadn't even considered. I mean, Jesus' answer to them is simple, it's straightforward. In verse 3, he says this, This happened, this blind man, so the power of God could be seen in him. Now, I want to tell you, this puts a twist on things. I mean, mean, Jesus kind of now rocked their world. I mean, when he's talking about this bad thing, this man being born blind, he's offering a different type of solution. Here's one of the things that Jesus is saying. He's saying God is not going to waste this man's suffering. I want you to know that today. If you're suffering, God is not going to waste it. These hardships in our community, God is not going to waste it. God is giving us an opportunity to get involved. And we have an opportunity to be able to be involved shining the light of Jesus. But before we just think about Jesus' answer, I want us to consider this. How many people do you think walked by the blind man? And even maybe the first time they walked by him, they went, and I wonder what I could do. But the second time they walked by him, they thought, I'm not sure I could do what I thought I could. And by the third time they walked by him, what did they think of? Nothing at all. I want to tell you that's what we're like. And we we can tend to just walk by things, and, and if we don't act, after a while, that hardship, That person that's suffering, they become white noise in the background of our life. The disciples saw the man, but Jesus truly noticed him. You know, Jesus was incredible at noticing people. I mean, Jesus spent time looking at people. You know, Jesus noticed that woman that sold her body so she could be loved. Jesus noted the father who was desperate when their child was at death's door. And Jesus noticed the leper who didn't have a community in which he could be involved in and was left alone in isolation and pain. Jesus noticed the children who everyone else wanted to ignore, but he was willing to allow them to come and take center stage. You know, Jesus noticed the cheater who had been allured by power and status. Jesus noticed people. That's what he did. The disciples, they see the man and they ask, what can be done about this? Jesus sees the man and he decides to act. The difference really between Jesus and the disciples is the disciples want to just talk about it, but Jesus wants to do something about it. You know, I think for us, we really need to continue to see how our hearts are geared. Are are they geared more like the disciples' hearts? Are they geared more like Jesus' heart? And before we leave Jesus' teaching, I want to make sure we catch a warning that we're offered here by Jesus. Here's what he says. We must quickly carry out the task assigned us by the one who sent us. Listen, the night is coming and then no one can work. What is Jesus saying? The the first thing he's saying to us is this, we need to be quick to act. I, I want to ask you personally, when you see someone in pain, when you see someone suffering, Are are you quick to act, or do you spend time plotting, thinking, trying to figure it out, or do you just see a need 
and you simply respond to the need. That, that's what Jesus is asking us to do. He also tells us that, that there are tasks that are assigned to you. Man, that, that's a powerful idea. I want you to let that marinate just for a minute. There are tasks assigned to you. Now, some of y'all, you love tasks. You love writing them down on your list and then the favorite part, crossing all of them off. Yeah? That's not the task that Jesus is talking about. Jesus is saying there are people that I'm going to place in front of you that you can continue to shine my light. You know, Paul says it this way, he says, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You know, do you believe it? Do you believe that God has works for you to do, works that are right in front of you this week, that you and I can go out and we can make a difference? And sometimes it's the little acts that are so big that make major impact. It makes me think of my friend Jill Harper. Jill attends our Westlink campus, and uh, Jill has a passion for helping people, but she also has a passion for photography. And for years, Jill has been um, someone who has taken pictures at weddings and served families. I mean, she has done countless weddings. I began to talk to her this week about how many she said, I don't even know. Well, just about a month ago, Jill began to have a conversation with another gal, Kim Pennington, who also attends Pathway, who works for um, the children's home. And she's one of our servants as a local partner in that ministry, that organization that's doing such great things for our city. And Jill and Kim began to talk a little bit about what the children's home was about and, and just how they could like continue to help talk about it in our community and let people know about it. And the Wichita Children's Home has been around for a long time. And when Jill heard this, she began to think about little children. Makes sense, right? Kids. And Kim said, no, we don't only serve kids. We serve kids all the way up until high school. And then Kim began to tell Jill, you know what? We're getting ready to have a graduation ceremony. We have a special event just to honor the families of those that have made it through high school and they're graduating. And Jill got intrigued, and she said, well, do the families do anything? Do they have parties? You know, do, what's the ceremony look like that you guys offer? And then she asked this question, does anyone take their picture? And Kim's like, no, those families can't afford that. It's something that, like, is beyond their ability. And Jill said, well, that's funny. I can do that. And so Jill went down to that graduation ceremony, and she took each student's portrait, and she made an impact. Now, isn't that awesome? I mean, Jill had a heart. It, it seems like, you know, I hope as you're listening to it, I hope as you're listening to it, you're thinking, not, not a big deal. You're right. Not for Jill. She's a master at this. I mean, to shoot a photo, to, to be able to edit it and get it back to someone, she's done that hundreds of times. But she was willing. What about you? I mean, what's that thing that you can do? That, that thing that you can give? I don't know what it's like for you. Maybe for some of you, you need to go back to school. You're like, that's the last thing I wanted to hear today. I'm not going back to school. No, maybe you need to go back to the classroom. Maybe you need to go back to the classroom just to tutor. Maybe you need to go back in the classroom to be a mentor or someone who can just help a teacher to come alongside them. I, I had a friend who was a teacher just last week call me and say, hey, Hutch, I need some grandparents we're having grandparent day, and, you know, there's a lot of kids that grandparents don't live here in the city, and they're not able to make, and there's some that don't have grandparents at all. I thought, what an easy thing. I mean, it's just something that we could do. I begin to think about a group of guys who went and helped years ago, those in relief of the Joplin tornado. And they served the Joplin area, and then when they got back together, they said, man, th this is good. I mean, these guys are all very mechanical. What could we do? And God just led them to something. There was an individual that needed a wheelchair ramp. And these men got together and go, well, we've never done that before, but I guess we could build a wheelchair ramp. We can figure it out. And so they built that wheelchair ramp. And I want to tell you, as of today, hear me says, they've built over a hundred wheelchair ramps for people in our community. Just amazing. I mean, just guys, yeah, you can clap for that. Just guys that are giving their time, they're giving their knowledge. 
You know, years ago, I had a student that told me, I love coming into your home because when I come in, it just makes me want to take a nap. I thought, that's a weird thing to say. I mean, do I have a soft bed, you know? Really, I heard them. What they were saying is, when I come into your home, I feel safe. It's peaceful. I can relax. I don't know what your thing is, but I know that you have something to give. I want to encourage you to be creative. I want to encourage you to think about your neighborhood. Think about your workplace. Think about the schools that our children attend. Maybe your children, maybe your grandchildren. There's places for us to serve here in our city where we can shine. I want you to think about our local partners. You know, for you today, maybe you need to go out and just get on our website and get to know our local partners to get to know them more so you can pray for the ministry that God has called them to do and and to email them something that would encourage them or even offer yourself to be able to serve them. You know, here's what I love about our local partners. They're not sitting around in a room going, man, our city has some pretty difficult hardships. People are in pain. What are we going to do about it? No, they're on the opposite end. They've rolled their sleeves up and they've decided this is what we're going to do about it. I love their heart. I love their heart for the next generation. So many of our local partners, they, they want to see kids be born. They want to see kids be in homes where they're cared for and loved. They want to see kids come to know Jesus and their families to be that stable environment that will provide a place where they can grow all of them in Christ. So many stories I'd love to share with you today, but I want to end on this one. I want to talk about one of our local partners, Safe Families. You know, Safe Families uh, has a mission, and it is simply to do this, to provide care and compassion for families in crisis. They want to come alongside those families that are struggling. And they work at matching up volunteers where kids can come into homes and land in a safe environment while their parents navigate difficult and challenging circumstances. And not only do they care about the kids, but they really want to build a relationship with those parents because they know that, man, if they build a relationship with those parents, if they can walk alongside someone who feels isolated or lonely, good things can happen. And just this last year, they had a dad that reached out to them. And this single parent, this father, was trying to get things right. He's making some positive changes in his life. And really for him, you know, it meant attending church, meant trying to do the right things. And he knew one of the things that he needed to do was to go into rehab to allow himself to continue to be sober as he's battled addiction for years, but he feared losing his kids. He's afraid that if he went into rehab, his kids may go into foster care, and so he reached out to save families, and they paired up two families to help with his children. And they brought his kids into these homes, and they provided this loving, safe environment. And not only did they do that, but you know what they did? They began to build a relationship with this single parent, this father, They began to text him while he was in rehab and let him know that someone was praying for him, let him know that his children were okay. And can you imagine just the bandwidth mentally and emotionally it provided for that father who was finally trying to get it together? It was amazing. It was an act of God. Safe Families was shining the light of Jesus. You know, once again, it would have been easy to kind of be like the Pharisees. You know, it would have been easy to be able to go, you know, well, why do bad things happen? Because this individual hasn't made wise decisions. That's why bad things happen. But they didn't do that. They said, no, we can stand in the gap. We can be the ones that truly allow this person, this family to experience Jesus. I want to ask you, what's your thing? What do you have to offer to shine in the lives of those who are suffering in our community? I want to give us some time.
to consider that. And so right now, I'd love for you just to bow your head, to close your eyes. And man, I just want to give you a little bit of space here so you can think about it. You know, let's not use this message as a point of discussion. Let, let's use this message to dial up our compassion so we can look around and figure out where God wants us to be. And I want to tell you during the message, you may have had God tell you something specifically that he wants you to do, show you a skill that you have or a passion that you have. Or maybe you're still trying to figure it out. But either way, whether God has shown it to you or, or whether you're trying right now to figure out what that thing is, I just want to ask you a real simple question. Are you willing to shine the light and love of Jesus in our community? Not just to talk about the problems, but to be willing to act on them. And if that's you and you're willing, I want you to raise your hand right now. Raise your hand at all of our campuses. Just as your sign, your commitment. If you're watching online, you can type, I'm in. I want to do that. And I'm grateful that even not knowing, you would be willing to move. And so I want to pray for us right now. Father, I just pray that for those you have already nudged in a direction, that you may provide opportunity for them. You, you may show them how they can use their gifts or you may show them how they can continue to chase after that, that passion that they have. And Father, for those who yet don't know, Lord, they're still going to figure it out in the days and maybe the week to come. I pray you'd show them. But I'm grateful, Lord, that we have people that want to act. We, we want to get in the game. We want to serve. We want to shine. And so, Lord, I pray that you just keep leading us. Let us fill the gap of those who need to experience who you are. You know, with everyone's head still bowed, I also want to let you know if you continue to read on, in this story, the blind man, Jesus makes this declaration. He says, I am the light of the world. I want to let you know if you haven't surrendered to Jesus Christ and the light and the life that he can bring to you, today's your day. Today's the day to surrender, to let Jesus come in and rescue you so that you can be the person that he created you to be. And if you know that's you and you know you need to surrender to Jesus to be your Lord, to be your Savior, I just want you to pray this prayer. At all of our campuses, those of you who are watching online, just let me lead you right now. Pray this in the stillness of your heart. Father, I thank you. I thank you for bringing me here so I could hear this message. I thank you, Lord, that you have a light that I need in my life. I pray that you would forgive me for trying to do life on my own and I surrender now to you, to the best I know, to what I understand. I just feel you calling me to you. And so Jesus, I just surrender. Please accept me. Show me how to live my life. You know, everyone's head still bowed. If you prayed that prayer for the very first time at all of our campuses, I want you to raise your hand right now just to show that you surrendered your life, that you prayed the prayer, that you asked Jesus to come in and lead you to be your light, to be the life that only he can provide. Raise your hands. If you're watching online, you can just type, that's me. And we want to celebrate with you today and we want to walk with you. So Father, I just thank you. I thank you for all the commitments that have been made today. And Father, for those that are going to shine the light of who you are in our community, I pray you would lead them to those that accept you for the very first time. I pray that you'd help them understand how much you love them and the great plan that you have for them. Jesus, thank you so much that you give us the opportunity not just to know you, but to be used. So would you use us this week for it's in your name that we pray, amen.